UCLA is a university with unlimited possibilities for students that desire world-class academics and research. Unmatched diversity, incredible cultural and social opportunities, successful alumni and career networking, first-class campus facilities, plus America's top intercollegiate sports teams. Located in Westwood, just a few miles from the Pacific Ocean, UCLA's one square mile campus is surrounded by famous cities such as Bel Air, Beverly Hills, Brentwood, and Santa Monica. Hi everybody and welcome to UCLA Bruin Talk. I'm Dave Marcus, joined by Courtney Casso. Springtime in Southern California, everybody's thinking of maybe going to the beach, but these guys are thinking about fall. We're going to talk with football in just a moment. But first, let's take a look at our upcoming events. Welcome back to Bruin Talk. We are pleased to be joined by a couple of guys right in the middle of spring practice and uh, itching to get out on the Rose Bowl turf. Clayton Tunney is a transfer quarterback from UC Davis. Eddie Williams, of course, an offensive lineman who missed the end of last year with a broken ankle. Gentlemen, welcome to Bruin Talk. Hey, thanks for oh. having us. Eddie, let's talk first about your ankle. It's got to feel good to get back out on the field. How you doing? Uh, it definitely feels great to be out there, you know, uh, back with the teammates. Uh, Kind of nervous though, you know, uh, trying to get my ankle back in, but uh, it, it seems to be working well for me right now. It had to be hard for you sitting and watching. Oh, uh, real tough, you know. It's uh, I think it's the player the hardest, hardest view to watch from the sideline. Can't help the teammates, you know. Clayton, you need guys like this to protect you. What are your thoughts coming into this as a transfer to the Bruin program at quarterback? Well, this spring's a little bit different. We have a new offense we're kind of working on, a lot more shotgun. We're not doing a huddle, per se. Um, so there's a lot of things for me to learn, but also um, I haven't had any snaps here, so i got to get a couple of those and get a feel for it and become comfortable with everything. It's going to be a big moment when April 24th you get out to the spring game, get out on the turf at the Rose Bowl. What's that going to be like? I'm excited. Um, last year I think we had eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 people there. So there's going to be a lot of people there, a lot of noise. Um, so I'm excited to make some plays. And even though it's an inner squad scrimmage, what, let me talk to you, Clayton. What are you looking to get out of that game? Um, well, the biggest thing is probably going to be the speed of the game. Um, I'm a quarterback. I have to be in charge of things. So I need to get people in the right positions. Uh, we need to obviously make plays. Um, so the whole thing will be the speed of the game. I need to be in charge. And Eddie, let me ask you, because you played in it last year. You've played and you've been here a couple of years. How do you keep the intensity high for that spring game when you're playing against your own guys? How do you guys get out there and really stay focused? Um, I think you just got to have the mindset that uh, you need to be be better, get better, and uh, do whatever it takes. And if it uh, takes, you know, um, getting a piece of your, your teammate and you know, taking his head off, then you got to do what you got to do. And uh, can't wait. It's, uh, it's going to be fun. Let, let's measure the, the pulse of the team. It was a great finish to the season last year. You got to a bowl game. Team went back, won the Eagle Bank Bowl. How does that translate into enthusiasm toward next year? Um, you know, we just uh, got to get better. And uh, I really can't say. I mean, we got a lot of new guys coming up, stepping up, a lot of freshmen coming up, trying to help the program. So 
I look forward to April 24th and seeing where, where we're at. You um, had a lot of injuries on the offensive line last year. You were one of them. Right. Uh, important to keep everybody healthy and active this year. Right. Uh, what, what's the biggest challenge for you coming back from an injury? I know you didn't spend the winter just sitting around. Um, How was your conditioning program? I had uh, a lot of help from Coach Lynn, our strength and conditioning coach, and our trainers in the training room. They helped me uh, get mobilized and uh, you know get up to speed. But um, for spring, it's kind of hard for me because uh, I wasn't in shape as much as Clayton and the rest of the teammates. But uh, you know, I'm doing my best out there and uh, slowly getting back into shape. Clayton, we think about weight training for the linemen. What's weight training like for a quarterback? <laughs> well, I mean, it's much the same. Uh, we're in there. We had a great off season. Um, but I mean, as far as the quarterbacks, uh, we got to be working on our shoulders um, and a lot of the core, your core things like that, your back muscles so you can throw the ball. But um, we, we had a great spring um, as far as the weight room and conditioning and all the quarterbacks are looking really good. Mental preparation is a really big part of the game, especially for you out there as a quarterback and leader. You got to be really mentally tough. So what do you do to mentally prepare yourself prior to a game? Well, the biggest thing is the playbook. Mm -hmm. We got a new playbook. Um, we have uh, audibles. We have um, signaling we have to do. We have code words, per se. Um, so I have to be on top of that. And I have to let everybody else know on the field. So I have to digest it and quickly give it out to all the different players. So mentally, I got to be on top of my, my game. And so you study that playbook a lot. I'm always in it. Good. I'm always studying. Nice. Part of being a quarterback is being a leader. Do you? find that you have to project an image of confidence even when you're not really sure what you're supposed to be doing on the play? Yeah, it was for the first couple of days, I really didn't know what I was doing. But as it comes, um, I think the whole team has really come together. Um, I mean, it starts with the linemen. I have to give them a protection. If it's a pass play or if it's a run play, they have to know where to go. I mean, it starts, give it to the linemen, and I give it to the wide receivers and running backs. But uh, I think they are seeing some leadership out of me as I get to learn the plays. Eddie, there's one thing to look at X's and O's and read a playbook. There's another thing getting full pads on, getting back out there. Right. You guys have recently gone into full pads. Tell us what it feels like to take those first hits. Um, Saturday, it was uh, kind of rough. You know, everybody excited to get into pads. Um, me, uh, fortunately, I didn't really uh, go all out, but um, I've I seen a lot of my teammates go all out, try to take a, like, take a teammate's head off. But um, it was fun. Everybody was anxious to get out and just hit. And uh, I'm glad we got that out the way so we can really focus on our playbook and our schemes and whatnot. As you learn your schemes, you learn your playbook, you learn your protections, you start projecting against the individual guys you're going to face up against in the fall? Or is it too early for that? Um, you could say that. You know, you could go back and watch film and look upon other schools and what, uh, what a D lineman or, you know, for Clayton, uh, defenses you going to face, but um, it could be a little too early, you know. Um, everyone gets a lot better as they progress and in, uh, in getting bigger, faster, stronger. So, you know, there's always room for improvement, you know. Tell us the timetable. You've got spring practice now. Then what are you doing between now and the start of the fall camp? Uh, well, um, when spring ball is done, uh, we, get, we go back to uh, off-season workouts uh, four days a week. Uh, we uh, run on Tuesday, Thursdays, and lift uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and uh, Wednesdays we have off. So um, that's basically it. And Clayton, one of the problems for athletes always, and especially for guys who are in such intense workouts, you got to get your schoolwork in too. How do you juggle all that? <laughs> well, uh, it's hard. We have our tutoring that we have, um, so we have to get to tutoring. But every night, uh, I'm either studying my playbook or studying for schoolwork. So it is hard, but uh, I get it done. So Clayton, you were an Aggie, now you're a Bruin. What does it mean to you to be a Bruin, and, and why did you make the decision? Why did you want to come here and, and be a Bruin and play for the team? Well, I went on a church mission for two years. Um, Where'd you go? I went to Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio. And after that, I came back to UC Davis, and things had changed. Um, they had kind of picked a quarterback, per se. Um, and one of my coaches went to the uh, Oakland Raiders. So there was just, uh, it was a little bit different than when I'd uh, been there before. So I talked to my parents, and 
my dad said, well, if you're not happy, you might as well look somewhere else. Um, so I looked other places. I looked back east first. Mm -hmm. My parents are from Columbus. Um, but then I got a hold of Coach Chow. He liked what he saw, and I, so I came here. But as far as being a Bruin, um, you know, I didn't really have the, the big Bruin pride they talk about until we went and played at USC. Um, but we getting off the bus at the Coliseum was pretty fun. Um, everybody was all amped up. And, uh, I mean, well, I was just going to ask you, now you get to be a part of a really huge rivalry. And next year, it's a home game for us. We got SC at the Rose Bowl. I mean, I know I'm looking forward to it. I can't imagine what you guys are feeling about it. So have you already started thinking about that game yet? Or, again, is that too early to... Are you just worried about spring right now? You know, Coach has made some, uh, said some things about Lane Kiffin. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we need to beat him. We need to beat the Trojans. Um, but first, we have Kansas State to worry about. That's okay. the focus that gets you going in the season. Guys, thanks for joining us. Best of luck in spring camp. Have a great spring game at the Rose Bowl, and we'll look forward to seeing you out there in the fall. Thank you. Thanks, guys. And we'll come right back to UCLA Bruin Talk right after this public service announcement. A trophy can be made just about anywhere. But there's one place where champions are made. UCLA, champions meet here. Welcome back to UCLA Bruin Talk. Next up, we have our Athlete of the Week. This week, we honor Cody Kiefer of the UCLA baseball team. This weekend, Cody went two for three with a game-high three RBIs in the final game of a three-game series with the Stanford Cardinal. Also, during a game against Cal Poly last weekend, Cody recorded a career-high five RBIs, helping to defeat the Mustangs 11 to seven. Cody is only a freshman, but he has already helped the Bruins get off to their best start in school history with a 23 and two record. Up to this point in the season, Cody has a 366 batting average, 30 hits, and 18 RBIs. Cody was selected to the MLB Scout Team All-Stars and had the opportunity to go pro instead of pursuing his college career, but decided to come to UCLA instead, and his impact on the team thus far has been tremendous. Congratulations, Cody, and good luck to the rest of the UCLA baseball team. If you'd like additional information about UCLA athletics, please visit our website at www.uclabruins.com. We talked a moment ago about springtime and wanting to get in the water, and somebody who's certainly been in the water a lot is our next guest, the head coach of UCLA Rowing in her eighth season, Amy Fuller Kearney. Thanks for joining us again. Thanks for having me. I just flashed back on the first time you visited with us. You were out basically looking for boats, and in those eight years, you built this program into a nationally respected program. Reflect on that progress. Yeah, it's been a great journey. It's been a fun ride. I mean, UCLA is a great place to sell and a great place to go to school, so um, we can attract top kids. And of course, the athletic department has been um, huge in helping us get the best fleet possible, and you know, all of our supporters actually. So it's it's been a great ride. The girls are doing a terrific job. Our notes say you're in your eighth year at the helm of the program, but that would really be at the bow of the program, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, I, th I think it's my ninth year, though. Your notes might be a little wrong, okay. but that's well, they okay. they were good last year. Yeah, that's right. Well, let's talk about this year. You're having, off to a great start this year. Yeah. Tell us about the team's progress. Uh, we have an incredibly strong young team this year. Our freshman class is the best we've had ever. Um, they've, they've bought in right out of the gate. They're enthusiastic. They have a great attitude. Um, our motto all year long has been, what would a champion do? You know, have the discipline of a champion every day. And and they're buying in. We're seeing huge improvements and, you know, sort of the underclassmen are pressing the upperclassmen to perform better and, and it's really paying off on the water, you know, so it's, it's fun to be a part of. That's great. And you guys have had a really strong season or start to your season so far. So how do you maintain that level and so they just don't get comfortable and, and kind of relax on their success so far? Interesting you say that. I mean, we just spoke about this this morning. Sometimes you sort of rest on your laurels a little bit, take your foot off the gas, and that's exactly the opposite of what we need to do because mm -hmm. even though we've won some races and we've had some good performances, we're nowhere near the top speed we're going to need to compete in the Pac-10, which is the toughest conference, obviously. Yeah. Um, so we just talked about this morning, you have to take a risk. got to get out of your comfort zone. Um, we always say get out of your comfort zone or get comfortable losing. 
Um, <laughs> and just don't be afraid to do something wrong because if we can take a risk and push ourselves, keep the, the foot on the gas, then maybe we'll um, even exceed our expectations. You've been a terrific contributor to Bruin Talk over your time here. You were on early at the start of the season. You kind of looked at your goals for the year. Have you reassessed them halfway through? No, we've, we've stuck with our goals. I mean, I think that our goals were lofty. I know that our goals were lofty, so, um, and it's fun to be in the hunt. I just said to the girls yesterday, if you look around at the results across the country, we are definitely in the hunt for a team at the NCAA championships. And again, we can't make any mistakes. We can't ease up. We can't think we've done something. The past is history. We're just going to use, you know, our arsenal of training and our physiology and our fitness and keep pushing forward and keep trying to get better. But uh, the goal has been an NCAA championship team bid, and it's not going to be an easy goal, but we're still, we're on, you know, track right now to make it possible. But it's a good goal to have. So Yeah, of course. If you're going to have lofty goals, I think right. that's the one to have, <laughs> right? right? So you were talking about your freshman, and this is the best class you've had probably thus far you've been coaching here. Yes. So what did you do differently, or what are you looking for in a recruit? What made this class so great this year? We did a lot of um, talking to them in the summer. We sort of pitted them. We had a good class last year, and we, we said, this is our best freshman class ever. How are you guys going to stack up? So a big change, actually, has been sort of you know, the evolution of Facebook, and they're all interacting before they even get here. And so they get here. They're was, like a team yeah, before they're right. a team. And then they're really proud of their class, and they want to be the best class. And so they came in with this already this attitude of like, no, we're going to be the best freshman. And that was huge. Um, so just communicating that kind of stuff and um, making it competitive from the minute they sign the letter, you know, without giving them a training program, make it competitive. That's great. Your team's coming off a real strong showing in San Diego last week. Talk about some of the individual standouts. Well, I think that um, obviously the Open 8 won the Carly Copley Cup, which was, it's an open event. So there's a lot of masters and some other collegiate programs in there. SC was in there. Um, we don't know how people prioritize boats and athletes for that particular event. So the the real finishes that stand out in my mind are the varsity getting top three. They beat Washington State and Harvard. Um, they fell behind uh, Virginia and USC, but close. And that was a great performance for them. That was our best ever performance at that invitational. Um, and then the novice eight got a silver, so that was really a great performance. Again, when we start talking about freshmen and building from the bottom up, this class is going to know how to win and then if you know, hopefully contribute in the next three years to the higher, faster boats. As you assess the team's performance, looking at a race many times over after it's done, are you looking at time, pace, position relative to other teams? How do you assess, I mean, obviously they give out medals, but how do you assess whether your team performed to its capabilities? That's a, um, that's a great question, and the answer is going to seem a little complicated, but there's actually a computer in the boat. Um, there's two, two things going on. One is a, um, there's speakers for the coxswain who drives the boat to, to um, communicate with the crew in terms of where they are and strategy of the race. And then there's another system, there's an impeller on the bottom of the boat, and it will give you a, sp a split. So <clears throat> throughout the course of the race, they're getting split feedback. Um, calibration on and off, it's not perfect, but it does give you relative speed throughout the course of the race. So there's four 500 meter pieces, and we're trying to have a certain you know, speed in each of those four 500s. Um, because you're right, it's, you can't go off of end time because you have tailwind, headwind, crosswind, current. Uh, I mean, if we went off of times, we'd probably clock some of the fastest times in the history of collegiate rowing out there on Bologna Creek with a strong tail current. Mm -hmm. you know? So we have to take everything with a grain of salt. The best information we have is looking at those speed coach splits and giving the crew feedback in that way. Your third 500 was a little too slow. Maybe you went out too hard in your first 500 could have gone better in your fourth 500. Now I have a <clears throat> fun kind of question. It, for a lot of sports, you know where the best seats in the house are, yeah. okay? Where are the best seats? Because the nature of the <coughs> course, you don't get to watch everything. Mm -hmm. So where do you tell fans? Where do you stand? What's the best spot? Here's the greatest thing about UCLA. Our race course has a beautiful bike path. It goes all the way it does. I've from been, yeah. start to finish. So you don't have to nice. pick a spot. You can see the start. You can cheer all the way for the mile and quarter down, and then once they win and you just go, great job, Bruins, you can keep on riding down to Manhattan Beach. Perfect. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I'm going to go back to a theme of my previous question because I'm intrigued by the point where technique, coaching, pace goes out the window and competitive spirit takes over. Do the boats get to a point where you just say, go for it, just, just as hard as you can? Where in the race is that point? Um, 
that's the that's all the time. It's all the time to be honest. We're the only sport that you start at an all out sprint. You start it's a six and a half minute race, six and a half to seven minute race. You start in an all out sprint, you build up this lactic acid and then you have to race um, for another, you know, five and a half minutes with just burning. And that's one of the biggest challenges. So there's certain strategies where you might take a move, we call them a power ten, a shift. Maybe the middle of the race, you might take a brew in 20. Okay, here we go, drop those splits. And then, of course, whoever finishes the line first, you know, crosses the line first wins. So no matter where you are with seven, six, 500 meters to go, you got to go, you know. So, but at that point, usually um, at this level, their engines are burning. And, um, and it's about keeping your composure, keeping your length, and really trying to row strong, even though, you know, your world is shrinking in on you. Tell us about the process of selecting the crew. You got to weigh the intangibles as well as mm -hmm. the physical results of the erg. Yeah, it. it's a long process. There's some objective measurements. Obviously, we look at the rowing machine. Um, the fastest um, people on that machine will get consideration for the top eight. Um, it's very rare that somebody who's not fast on the ergometer is going to be in one of the top eights. Um, because the bottom line is you have to have power. Power is the number one thing you need. And the erg measures power. Um, and fitness, so you also have to have fitness. But so we look at that. We also look at dynamic, you know, how they work within the boat. Um, length is the second most important thing. So if somebody has a ton of power and they're five foot two, they might not be able to match the length of some of the six foot six foot two girls. So that's going to that's going to call that's going to you know cause them to be maybe step down to a, into a boat with people that are smaller. Um, there are short people that can make it work. They just have to be really flexible and very explosive in a weaker position. Um, so we look at that, and then there's also some subjective measurements in terms of what kind of team player are they? Are people going to trust you? Do you show up every day and work hard? Do you come with a positive attitude? Do you have the spirit of a champion? Do you want to move forward and build and take risks? And those are some intangible things, but um, you know we're looking at them all the time. You're you're an intense coach. You're a really great coach. I love your philosophy, and you focus a lot on academics too. And you have a team that does very well academically. Uh, I know in 2007, I believe you guys had 10 all Pac-10 academic honors. Yeah. So how do you get the girls to really balance everything, time management, and to do well in the classroom as well? Well, one of the things that's unique about our sport is that there are, um, it's such a disciplined sport. You have to be mentally disciplined to do well in rowing. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see a lot of the Ivy Leagues going fast and Stanford going fast. Yeah. And, it's, it's a very mentally tough sport, and it requires a lot of discipline. Not most sports do, but there's something about rowing where if you have that sort of discipline in the classroom, you tend to have that sort of discipline in the water, mm -hmm. on the water. So um, we see that, and then also we have a lot of walk-ons. So they get into UCLA on their own, yeah. so they're pretty bright kids. And guess what? They raise the bar. Uh, it makes it competitive for everybody else on the team, they help everybody on the team, and so there's just an expectation that we're going to be going for that top GPA spot every year. And it's no easy feat to get into UCLA right. without any help. They're amazing, amazing, tough. amazing young women. And then to come in, not having come here to row, and then just dive into this varsity sport, 20 hours Division a week, one. six days a week, I mean, they're, they're great. And they really, this year, have been such an incredible contribution. Um, they are just doing an amazing job. And real quick, let me touch on how many do you have on your roster? <laughs> I don't think people realize this. No. I don't think we, I realize no. this. No, we, currently we have 55 athletes and three coaches. So you are in essence trying to manage 55 young yeah. women. Yeah, and it is, how? it is sometimes overwhelming. It is sometimes where you have to say, look, you can't call me after 8.30 at night because my phone will never stop ringing. Yeah. I have a family. <laughs> yeah. Text me in the morning if there's something that you have to mispractice for. Um, actually, I say don't text me. Call me because I'm driving and I can't answer. Mm -hmm. I can't <laughs> right. answer Smart. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but um, yeah, so there is. You know, you do have to draw some lines and boundaries. You know, and and um, and really make yourself available all other times via phone, office, email, just to try and help them out. But luckily at UCLA, they have so many amazing resources. Mm -hmm. All of the work doesn't just fall on the coaches. I mean, they have their academic counselors and their mentors and. Yeah, there's just a lot of people that are there to support them, so we rely on them heavily. <laughs> yeah, I bet. You were a tremendous competitive rower, Olympic silver medalist, world champion, gold medalist, and silver medalist. I mean, you, you did it all. How does that translate into your coaching philosophy? 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think when I was a young coach, I, this is my 17th year or so coaching, and I, I think that uh, I had a high expectation for everybody. Like, they would just have that same drive and that same push. Um, but most athletes don't. Otherwise, everybody would be Olympians. You know, most athletes are, they don't have that same push. So then I have to sort of curtail um, my expectations to what's realistic for them but also keep their bar very high. I'm hoping this year we have three freshmen that are gonna to go to US national team freshman camp. Um, so I'm hoping to get some Olympian Bruins in the near future. But again, the vast majority of those 55 women, they're collegiate athletes. And for me, I have to push them, teach them to be limited by their potential and not by their competition. Mm -hmm. So just keep pushing for what you can do. Um, and it seems to work, I mean, it's not, I can't expect them all to be Olympic rowers because they aren't. But it's it's fun to have that background. It's fun to share stories with them. I have tons of anecdotes, and I think sometimes they they like that I did that, and sometimes they don't like it. You know, because they're like, "Oh, coach, <laughs> she pulled this or mm -hmm. score," and um, but it makes your expectations higher of them as well. Yeah, yeah, it does. Well, the collegiate season and rounding into crunch time. You can follow the Bruins' progress on UCLABruins.com, or better yet, come on out and watch them. They're out at Bayona Creek. It's been wonderful having you in. Thank I you learn so something much. every time. And thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank you for joining us. We'll be back next time with another edition of UCLA Bruin Talk. For Courtney Casso, I'm Dave Marcus. So long. <laughs>